What's up, Falcons Nation? It's your boy, Jew, coming at you with another Atlanta Falcons video. As always, Falcons Nation, rise up. It is Victory Monday, and I do want to talk about the game yesterday, do my post-game show. We did take on the Carolina Panthers in Charlotte yesterday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, and we did defeat them 29-3. to uh, We basically demolished them. I told you guys um, during the bye week when I made my video that we really could go on a winning streak and we could really get back into the thick of things as far as in the playoff picture and also get back in the thick of things in this NFC South. I did believe because all of our games was on this back end that this team would show improvements. And I told you that this team and this defense was turning a corner. Um, the last game we played before the bye week against the Seattle Seahawks, I seen the defense turn a corner and I talked about that in that video. So let's jump right into the uh, the breakdown of the game yesterday and the things that I liked and the things I saw, the things that I feel like we may need to improve on. But it was more positive things than negative things I saw yesterday. It wasn't much negative I saw yesterday. But let's jump right into it. Um, let's talk about the defense first. This defense is playing lights out, man. Within the last two games, the last eight quarters, we haven't allowed a touchdown. No rushing touchdowns, no passing touchdowns. And, the, and you would believe, okay, well, maybe we played some scrubs. Well, we haven't played scrubs. We went to New Orleans with Drew Brees and that high vaunted offense, a 7-1 and one team. We were going in at 1-7. and seven. We shut them down. They had no touchdowns in that game. Then we turned it around with a performance yesterday in Carolina, two back-to-back -back road games, and shut these teams out without any touchdowns. That's very impress um, impressive. And this is the defense that I know a lot of you probably have been looking, um, thinking and saying, this is the defense that we've been looking for all season. Where has this team been? Where have this defense been? I'm going to answer that question in this video. The number one thing that I'm noticing with this defense is the scheme has changed. We were running a lot of 3-4. And one thing that I'm noticing, I noticed it yesterday, we went back to running some 4-3 scheme. If you go back and watch the game yesterday, if you replay, like, uh, video the game or DVR the game, and you go back and watch the game from yesterday, I've seen a lot of 4-3 being run. Three linebackers on the field, uh, Devondra Campbell, Deion Jones, and Afoye Aluakon on, on, the, uh, on the defensive side of the ball playing snaps together uh, and having that four uh, defensive down linemen, having three defensive linemen, Four or four defensive linemen, three linebackers. I seen a lot of that yesterday. And I feel like this was the right move. And this is what I told y'all about um, cohesion, this team being cohesive, this team starting to jail, players starting to learn their roles. I talked about um, a couple weeks ago during our bye week, uh, I told you in that Seattle game, I felt like Kendall Sheffield and Isaiah uh, Oliver were making strides. They were playing with more confidence. They were turning the corner as far as their technique, especially with Isaiah Oliver. He's starting to look like a breakout player, man. As I talked about in one of my other videos about players that could possibly break out, I talked about the two young corners, Isaiah Oliver and Kendall Sheffield. Both of those guys are balling out right now. If you look yesterday, Isaiah Oliver was uh, deflecting passes like crazy. Um, Desmond Trufant came back and had a pick. Ricardo Allen had a pick yesterday. Um, DeMonte Casey uh, had a pick. They were just flying all around. They were flying around in the back end. They were flying around. The communication has been there since the bye week. You see guys looking at each other, talking, communicating. Uh, even Devondre Campbell. I was on Devondre Campbell's back uh, the f first half of the season. But I told you guys, I really didn't think that Devondre Campbell was a terrible player. I talked about... With you, when you change schemes, you change defensive uh, uh, defensive coordinators with Dan Quinn becoming a defensive coordinator and getting rid of Marco Emanuel, and then you switching from a 4-3 to a 3-4. I told you it was going to take time for these guys to learn the scheme because what I'm noticing about these guys on defense, the main thing that I'm picking up on when the scheme um, has been changed, these guys look more comfortable playing a 4-3. That's just how, to, to me, when I watch the game, that's what it looks like. And it looks like we're doing more adjustments in the game, in-game adjustments. To me, early in the season, we ran pretty much that three, uh, cover three, that uh, soft zone coverage. And teams picked that zone apart. They took the underneath throws all day long. Now I'm seeing different schemes. I'm seeing blitzes. As I talked about 
Dan Quinn early in the season. We need to add blitz packages. I'm seeing all kind of blitz packages. I'm seeing defense alignments like Jack Crawford drop off the line and uh, you know drop off in, in zone coverage. And I'm seeing zone blitzes. I'm seeing corners coming in from blitzes. I'm seeing linebackers coming off the edge blitzing. Surprising, you know, I'm seeing safeties coming in on blitzes. That's what you have to do in this league. Teams and offensive coordinators are too smart for you to do the same thing over and over and over again. I don't care how good your players are. I hear a lot of people talking about um, Seattle and how Seattle had Pro Bowl talent, and that's how they were able to run that cover three zone coverage a lot. They did run that coverage a lot, but if you think about it, as uh, Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor, after those two runs they had to the Super Bowl, people started to expose that defense. When Dan Quinn left, or even when Dan Quinn, before Dan Quinn left, but definitely when Dan, when Dan Quinn left, that coverage that they were running started to get exposed. We were one of the teams that exposed them. Us and Kyle Shanahan in that division around playoff game against Seattle and Atlanta, we exposed them playing that zone, that zone coverage. We exposed the Seattle Seahawks. And that's what was happening with Dan Quinn. I felt like early in the season, we were not making enough in-game adjustments. But the reason that I don't completely fault Dan Quinn for not making the adjustments, because I hear a lot of people saying we should have made these adjustments sooner. The thing about it is the players, even if we would have made the adjustments earlier, meaning stop running so much soft zone and going straight into man coverages and things of that nature, I think Dan Quinn was trying to give these young guys a chance to um, get tape out there, for him to be able to get some tape on them. And I believe in the bye week, he was him and his defensive coaches, uh, Jeff Albrick, um, Raheem Morris, I think they were able to go and watch players' technique in the soft zone coverage and watch even in the, some of the man coverage that they started to run against Seattle and against uh, Arizona because they didn't run straight soft zone against those teams. They did start to add a little bit of more blitzing and things of that nature because Dan Quinn had given up some of the play calling at that point against Arizona um, and against Seattle. So once we did that, I think they were able to, in a bye week, go back and say, what are these players' strengths and what are these players' weaknesses? And I think that's the reason that we didn't make any serious adjustments until the second half of the season after our bye week. Because like I was saying before, when you're preparing for a team and you only have three to four days to prepare for them for the next game, you don't have a full week, that full bye week, to try to catch your breath and try to see you know what the the player's strengths and weaknesses are it's kind of hard to make those tweaks in the middle of a season or a middle of a work week that when you have that bye week that gave them time to go back and view the first eight games to see what these players do well and what these players struggle with and i believe now that they were able to view the view those uh tapes you know view tapes on each player and see you know what they're good at they were able to figure out okay this is what Vic Beasley does well. He's better dropping off or he's better with his hand in the dirt. This is what Tack McKinley does well. This is what um, Adrian Claiborne does well. This is what Grady Jarrett does well. This is what Isaiah Oliver does well as far as playing more man-to-man coverage instead of all of that zone, soft zone coverage where he's playing off the ball. He's playing way back five and five and six and seven yards off the, the receiver. I think they were able to go in and view the tape on these players because if you think about it, Last year, they did, the team didn't have a ton of take on uh, a ton of tape on Isaiah Oliver. They pretty much didn't have no tape on Kendall Sheffield because Kendall Sheffield's a rookie. So all they pretty much have on him is college tape. So I believe those first eight weeks was vital. I told you guys, I usually give players at least eight weeks in a season to see if this player is regressing or if this player is making improvement. And I told you guys in my uh, in my bye week uh, videos that. I felt like these young players like Isaiah Oliver, Kendall Sheffield were turning a corner. And now you see what I was talking about when I said that these guys were turning a corner. Because yesterday these guys were playing man, a lot of man-to-man -man coverage. They were playing with confidence. They were flying all around. They were diving for balls. They were intercepting the ball. They were deflecting passes. They were turning their heads around when the ball was coming. I don't believe I saw hardly any pass interference. If they were, I don't believe it was. I didn't see any pass interference yesterday on Isaiah Oliver. I didn't see any illegal contact calls on Isaiah Oliver. So that's what I mean by I seen him making strides because early in the season, he was clutching, he was grabbing, he was getting a lot of uh, penalties called on him for his pass interference and for illegal contact. Same thing with not so much with Kendall Sheffield. Kendall Sheffield kind of hit the ground running, but um, another big change that they made, and I called for this change during the bye week 
moving Casey back to the safety role. But that's what I was talking about. About we had um, in the bye week. I was talking about and having that eight weeks period. Dan Quinn got to see in that first eight week period. Casey is a better free safety. That's his natural position. I don't care what he played in college because he played cornerback in college. He's not a cornerback in this league. He's a free safety where he can play the middle of the field because he's a ball hawk and he's a big hitter. But in order for him to be able to set up those big hits and be able to spy and run around and use his instincts, he has to play the, the free safety role or the safety role in general, whether it's free safety or strong safety. So I talked about that in my, my bye week video about we didn't know. And I talked about this in our vid, my video, and this was months ago, maybe two to three months ago. When I talked, I did my video about why the Atlanta Falcons were struggling. I talked about um, Demonte Casey and Kendall, um, not Kendall Sheffield, but Isaiah Oliver. Both were unproven commodities. Both of them. A lot of people forget that Robert Alfred was our starting corner last year, and Brian Poole was our nickel corner, and Casey was actually playing free safety. And Isaiah Oliver really wasn't getting any snaps last year. Really, he was like a backup player. So both of those guys, uh, Casey changed his whole position where he tried to convert from being a NFL safety, free safety, back to playing nickel corner, uh, cornerback. And then um, Isaiah Oliver went from being a bench player to being a starter on the other side of uh, Desmond Trufant. So he was just basically thrown in the fire. No, uh, Dan Quinn or nobody really had any solid tape, NFL tape on him to know what he was capable of. So... It was that's why I said it took time to jail. So I feel like even if Dan Quinn would have made some of these changes earlier in the season, I still think these players would have struggled because these guys needed time to build chemistry. The main thing that I noticed, and I said this against uh when we played Seattle, it was no communication. I, I don't know if y'all go back and watch the Seattle game when they were on the goal line when Metcalf had those two touchdowns, uh DK Metcalf, when he had those two touchdowns, basically the defensive players were running all over the place. They didn't know who to guard. We had players guarding two guys, leaving DK Metcalf wide open in the back of the end zone. Two different on two different occasions, guys didn't know what the defensive play call was. And I feel part of that was communication issues because we had new players, meaning like Isaiah Oliver and Kendall Sheffield playing together. I also feel like the guys were confused about that three-four scheme. And the reason I say that is. If you look at a player like a De uh, Devondre Campbell, it's showing now that Devondre Campbell is not as bad as he looked in those first eight weeks. In the first eight weeks, he looked horrible. He looked like one of the worst linebackers in the league or one of the worst starting linebackers in the league. But in these last two weeks uh, since the New Orleans game, Devondre Campbell looks like a totally different player. He looks like the player that was playing with us the year we went to the Super Bowl. He's covering and uh, he's playing better coverage. He doesn't look as confused as he was looking because it was a couple times in that Arizona game where if you go watch Brian Baldinger's uh, him doing break uh, tape breakdown and film breakdown, it was plays where Devondre Campbell was not even guarding anyone. He was just standing in the middle of the field, field when he's supposed to be guarding or covering a running back out of the backfield. He would just be standing in the middle of the field. Or it was times where he was supposed to be dropping into coverage in a cover three in a cover three zone. He was supposed to be dropping to the middle of the field, and I seen players catching crossing patterns right behind him or right in front of him because he didn't know what he was supposed to be doing. And I feel like that's where the bye week has really helped this team and this defense. Is if you watched the game yesterday, I seen all kind of different blitz schemes. I'm seeing games being run on the defensive line. I'm seeing pressure on the quarterback consistently. Us not just getting pressure, getting pressure home, but actually sacking the quarterback. I'm seeing us doing a better job of bracketing, meaning not allowing a, a mobile quarterback to run outside of the pocket. Because Kyle Allen, he's not like a Lamar Jackson, but he still is a decent mobile quarterback. Like he can actually run and scramble out the pocket to try to pass the ball. But yesterday, every time it looked like he tried to escape the pocket. It was like a, a shoehorn or a U around him, like a circle around him, where he could not escape the pocket or step up or step back or run outside. It was pressure coming from all uh, every area of the defensive line. Um, Adrian Claiborne, Tat McKinley, um, Grady Jarrett, this whole defense has been playing like they're possessed, man. Uh, Ricardo Allen um, being that leader on the back end, talking to the, you know, being the, the mouthpiece for that secondary. 
everybody looked like they're on the same page. That's what I'm noticing with this team. And I told you guys, these guys were turning the corner. And now they've turned the corner. And now that they've turned the corner, like I said, it's no game on this on this rest of this schedule that I don't think we can win. We really could run the table. Because I'm definitely not worried about the Buccaneers this week. They got to come to Atlanta. Man, we just won two back-to-back -back road games. So uh, hopefully those Fairweather, uh, Fairweather fans, those, fa those Falcons fans that was walking away from their seats and walking away from this team, hopefully they're back in the, in the, uh, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium this Sunday to cheer on these Atlanta Falcons, man. Because they've given us plenty to cheer about with, within the last two weeks. They're showing you that this team is not as bad as those first eight games um, showed. And I think a another thing that this team isn't getting credit for is a couple of those games that they won or lost early in the season was winnable games. They came down to like the last drive. Um, the game against the Cardinals came down to a missed PAT by Matt Bryant. Um, the game against the Colts was a winnable game early in the season. It was a number of those games in that early in the season where we had a chance to win those games and they just slipped through our fingertips and the ball just was not bouncing our way. We couldn't get any turnovers. It would be plays where we caused fumbles early in the, the first eight games of the season. We didn't recover uh, recover a single fumble that we caused early in the season. Every time it looked like the it looked like the um, quarterback would be the one re recovering his own fumble, or, or the running back or whoever fumble would be covering recovering their own fumble. But now it's like the pendulum has swung, and it's swinging right now in the Atlanta Falcons' direction. It had swung really left early in the season, and now it's swung dramatically back to the right where now it's like everything is going our way we're having all the luck in the world Devondre Campbell caught an interception yesterday where the ball was just like bounced right into his hands and he was able to corral it um Julio Julio Jones had a nice game yesterday Matt Ryan and the offense was clicking yesterday um let's go ahead and talk about a little bit about the offense so the offense because that's enough about the defense on the offensive side of the ball I talked about in the in the bye week and in my pregame video, we need to continue to do what we did with Matt Schaub when, when he started in the Seattle game. Run the ball, get yardage, be patient, because that's the number one thing. I, another thing I really noticed early in the season, Dirk Cutter was not patient with the running game. It was like if we, we were getting those one and two yard gains and he was not satisfied. And then we would just throw the whole game plan out and we would just go to, OK, we're going to drop Matt Ryan back 50 times in this game and see if he can bring us back. Where you have to allow your offensive line to get rested and get and gain strength. And the way that the offensive lineman can uh, gain momentum is by running and crashing into the defensive lineman and establishing the line of scrimmage. Meaning not having them pass protect all game because it's hard to pass protect all game where you're backpedaling all game and somebody's coming at you all game. Now we're going at these def uh, offensive lines on these defensive lines. We're going at these defensive lines, with, uh, defensive lines with our running game. We're punishing them with our bigger backs. Now we're finally using Brian Hill and Quadra Olison because of the injuries to uh, Freeman and Edo Smith. We're starting to pound teams on the inside, pound the ball with these running backs, and we're starting to control the, the uh, control the off uh, offense and control the clock. With our offense, we're keeping our defense off the field for the most part. We're converting on third downs. But the reason we're able to convert on these third downs where I felt like in the first half of the season we weren't converting is we're doing a better job at getting in third and manageables. We're not having a ton of third and longs. And the reason we're not having a ton of third and longs is because we stayed with that short passing game where Matt Ryan isn't being sacked um, excessively. And we're also running the ball for three and four yards a clip, which makes it easy. Even if you run for two yards a clip, if you run the ball two times and you get four yards, that's third and uh, third and six, which is manageable. If you can get to third and six or third and five and below, your whole playbook is open. Where early in the season, we were killing ourselves with penalties. We were not staying ahead of the chains. We were allowing Matt Ryan to be sacked way too much. We were doing way too many five-step drops. And that was causing Matt Ryan to be uh, beaten up. Like you see when he got hurt in that Rams game, the Rams were bullying us. We didn't attempt to establish the run game in that game. We came out trying to be gunslingers, throwing the ball all over the place. They had Matt Ryan dropping back doing these and having these receivers run the longest routes possible. And 
our defensive line, I mean, our offensive line was not able to protect Matt Ryan early in the season. But another thing I talked about is with our offensive line is they were, they, I felt like after the bye week, I felt like the guys, after these eight games, they were learning to jail a little bit more. And it's looking like the offensive line is starting to jail. Because you remember early in the season, we kept handling, uh, having injuries on our offensive line. We had Chris Lindstrom go down. We had um, Jamon Brown go down for a couple games. And that that's what we had. Uh, Wes Schweitzer playing, some, playing at guard. So it was just a lot of different things that I'm noticing with this team. And I told you guys, once we get healthy, the offensive line, because we're getting ready to get Chris Lindstrom back. And once we get Chris Lindstrom back, man, this offense is probably going to go to another level because Chris Lindstrom is a road grader. He um, He's a big guy. He's a guard. He's physical. He's nasty. At Boston College, he went to Boston College. Boston College is a, a college football team that likes to run the football. So um, Chris Lindstrom is a very physical uh, beast in the middle, right next to Alex Max. Those are two um, nasty guys in the middle. And then on top of that, Caleb McGarry is just a dog, man. He's been balling out. He's only a rookie, but he's playing like since those first eight games, even in the first eight games, he played well. But now he's tur- he's another player that's turning a corner, man. He's looking like he's possibly going to be an all pro uh, right tackle. He's been excellent. He shut Cam Jordan out last week uh, uh, from getting a sack. This week he was shutting down Mario Addison. He was locking him up, not letting letting him get to uh, get to the quarterback. So he's just been doing an excellent job protecting the Matt Ryan. Now, what I tell you guys about Matt Ryan, all of the Matt Ryan haters, I said if you give Matt Ryan time to stand up tall in the pocket and make clean, have a clean pocket and make, uh, he was going to make great passes, make accurate passes. He's Matt Ryan is still a great quarterback in this league. He throws the ball with great velocity. He throws the ball with great accuracy. If you've seen that one pass where I think it was Mario Addison almost sacked him and he threw that ball down the field and they were in a cover two where Luke Keekley was trying to guard Julio Jones that ball really went right in the bread basket. Julio Jones caught that ball with one hand right in the bread the bread basket. That ball dropped over his head right into the bread basket. It was nothing that Luke Keekley could do or any cornerback or anybody could do at that point because it was just a perfect pass. And the, the guys on the telecast was talking about that. Uh, Mark Slareff, who works for um, Fox Sports and FS1, he talked about it because um, he was uh, broadcasting the game or during the game. He said... It's no defense for a perfect offense or a perfect pass. There's no defense for a perfect pass. And Matt Ryan threw a dime on that play. Another play where um, he threw a touchdown to Calvin Ridley in the back of the end zone. Pinpoint accurate. Threw it to the outside where only his guy could catch the ball. Just Matt Ryan was just balling yesterday, man. Um, Brian Hill didn't look great yesterday, but I knew yesterday that it was going to be tough to run on Carolina's defense because they're very stout. I talked about that in my uh, my pregame show that uh, the Carolina Panthers have one of the best defensive lines in the game. Um, they're very physical and they're big up front with the Dontari Poe and with um, Gerald McCoy and uh, F.A. Obata, Mario Addison, all of those guys, Bruce Irvin. They have a lot of pass rushers, but this shows that that offensive line is coming around because I don't remember hearing – None of those guys' name for the most part. I think they may have had one or two sacks on the to- in the whole game where we were shutting them down. Um, we were shutting them down. Our defense had four picks yesterday, six or five or six sacks yesterday. Like I said, man, this team has turned a corner. This Atlanta Falcons team has turned a corner. But like I said, for the offense, one thing that major thing that I also noticed, uh, Dirk Cutter and his play calling, like I said, has been a lot better. He's being more patient. He's running the ball. I'm seeing different wrinkles. Like, I like the wrinkle I seen where they did, like, a reverse to uh, Justin Hardy. And it was, like, a nice one receiver went the one way, one receiver went the other way. He handed the ball off to the – act like he was going to hand it off to the running back and handed it off to Justin Hardy right around the edge. It was a nice little trick play. And I like what I'm seeing out of uh, Dirk Cutter and the play calling. He's gotten away from throwing the ball a, a thousand times, and he's finally adding balance and allowing this offensive line to attack their opponent and stop uh, watching, stop having to be on their heels all the time, pass protecting. And they're doing an excellent job of protecting Matt Ryan. And like I said, 
None of these games come, uh, going forward, it's impossible for us to win. We can win any of these games. But I'm loving what I'm seeing out of both Dirk Cutter and this offense, man. I'm loving what I'm seeing out of receivers. So, like, letting go of Muhammad Sanu was the right decision because Russell Gage has stepped right in, hasn't missed a beat. He's came come right in. Um, he almost had a touchdown catch yesterday, but the defender knocked the ball out at the last second when he went when he was uh, landing to the ground when he was going to the ground. Uh, the ball came out, but Russell Gage has done an excellent job of filling in. Um, Justin Hardy has done a, good, a great job also of moving up in the depth chart. And this Falcons team, like I said, man, uh, Calvin Ridley's looking excellent. Julio Jones always looks excellent. Julio is just Julio. He's been balling out as well. But like I said, I'm loving what I'm seeing out of this team. And I think, um, like I was saying before, that anything is possible for this team. I don't think that uh, Dan Quinn's time is up in Atlanta. I don't think it. I, if I was uh, Arthur Blank, excuse me, I would keep this coaching staff together. I wouldn't get rid of anybody. Unless someone gets hired, like as a head coach somewhere else, I would try to keep this, this staff together. Also, some players that possibly could get re-signed. I, I know y'all don't want to hear this, but Vic Beasley's playing a lot better, and this defense is playing a lot better. And I wouldn't mind if we can bring uh, Vic Beasley back at a discount, depending on how he plays the rest of the season. But if he continues what I saw yesterday, he could possibly get extended. It won't be a huge contact, a uh, huge contract, but I do believe that Vic Beasley could possibly earn an extension, a one or two year extension. But it just has to be at the right price because I'm not overpaying for Vic Beasley. But I'm not also going to just throw him out for nothing, meaning let him go to free agency and walk for nothing because. Vic Beasley is showing when he's used in the proper way, um, used in a correct scheme, that he can reward you. So I'm liking what I'm saying there. I'm loving what I'm saying out of Tap McKinley. He's bringing that bull rush and that pressure. He had a sack yesterday. Um, he's been very disruptive. Um, Grady Jarrett, same thing. Very disruptive up front. Um, Adrian Claiborne, one of the guys couldn't even block Adrian Claiborne. He was coming off the edge so fast yesterday using his hand movements, using his technique, using his bull rush to go uh, go at these offensive linemen. So with that being said, man, I, I try to tell all of these fans, man, that was jumping ship. I told you guys, just relax. It's not over. Dan Quinn is an excellent coach. You don't go from being a Super Bowl head coach to being plummeting and dropping as the worst head coach in the league. It doesn't happen like that. Smart coaches and smart head coaches, if they need to make adjustments, they're willing to bring on a new hire. And that's what I was talking about. They're willing to bring in help. Like Dan Quinn uh, giving up those uh, positions, those the defense coordinator position and allowing Raheem Morris and allowing Jeff Albrick to coach the defense and the call plays. That was a smart move. And that's what smart CEOs do. When your business is bottling out or belly going belly up, you and you you make changes. You don't continue to do the same thing over and over again. That's called insanity. So Dan Quinn made the proper adjustments. When the bye week came and he had time to make adjustments, he made the adjustments. He did everything that we've asked as Atlanta Falcons fans for the most part. He um re-signed the play the proper players that need to be re-signed him and Thomas De, uh, Thomas Dimitrov. He also did an excellent job um of making the proper adjustments. Like I just said, he um you know, they let go of Muhammad Sanu. They let go of uh, Matt Bryant, which is turning out to look like it was the right move because the young kicker, young Wei Koo, is balling out. He's making his field goals. He's making his PATs. He hasn't cost us a game yet. Knock on wood. He hasn't cost us a game. So it looks like all of the moves and all of the buttons that Dan Quinn pressed were the right buttons. So I don't understand why all these people in these talking heads are still saying, Dan Quinn needs to go. I don't know if Dan Quinn is going to still stick around or be around if it's up to Arthur Blank. I feel like Dan Quinn should be around. The reason I say that is because this team has made a complete 360. And you can't tell me that that complete 360 is just because of these assistant coaches. No, they made a big 360 because Dan Quinn is an excellent head coach. Point blank in a period. The, def uh, the defensive coordinators and the coaches that are helping with the team, they deserve credit too. But I've been seeing a lot of people act like Dan Quinn doesn't deserve any of this credit. That this should all go to his assistant uh, assistants. I don't agree with that. I feel like Dan Quinn is an excellent coach. 
He took us to a Super Bowl. We didn't win it, but we were really close to winning it. We lost it in overtime. So, if I were uh, if I was uh, Arthur Blank, I would really sit back and look at how well this team is playing, and and make the decision based off of this is the person that made this decision to bring in so and so, and this person is being productive. So, with that being said, y'all let me know what y'all think in the comments. Um, as far as where the Atlanta Falcons are headed, I really think the big things um, are ahead. That it's not over yet as far as the playoffs. I do feel like we're going to get a win at home against Tampa this week to be 4-7. and seven. And if we can just keep stacking wins, we just need a couple losses for the Saints. If we can get the Saints to drop a couple games and, and let the two games that Atlanta, Atlanta play, to see, um, play the Saints, hopefully that be the, that be the deciding factor of who goes to the playoffs um, with us playing them next week. Hopefully it comes down to the Saints starting to lose games. We're starting to come on a rise. And we surprise a lot of teams because I want to remind you guys, the Giants did go, I believe, 10 and 6 or 9 and 7. They were a wild card team. I believe the sixth seed, the lowest seed you can be in the playoffs, and they won a Super Bowl against the undefeated, uh, the undefeated New England Patriots. So don't sleep on this team, man. This team is very capable. This team is very capable of reeling off a couple more wins and definitely putting us right back in the thick of things with playoffs. Uh, for the playoffs but i'm loving what i'm seeing out of my team i'm loving what i'm seeing out of dan quinn and those coaching adjustments i'm loving what i see out of the players because i told y'all before another thing in my video julio jones talked about it in the locker room after they lost i think to seattle he said this is not all on on, on coach quinn we have to put on our higher hats and go to work basically that's what uh julio jones said we're not gonna just pass the buck and say we're losing because of um we're losing because of Dan Quinn. No. He said we need to go in there and take ownership of our particular games. Take ownership for our job that we should be doing. And let's go out and ball. And that's what they've been doing since the bye week. So I can appreciate a leader like Julio Jones that knows the chemistry and knows these guys super well on this team. And I don't feel like those te- those guys were offended. I feel like he um, got the team ready to play. I feel like uh, Julio Jones' speech a couple weeks ago was just a wake-up call to all of the players that it's easy to blame a, a head coach or blame someone for your mistakes. But he talked about it. It's time to take ownership. It's time for us to stop making the same mistakes week after week after week, like a Devondre Campbell was doing. But now he has turned the corner. So I have nothing but adulation and respect for Devondre Campbell because he didn't sit back and continue to do the same things over and over and over again. He started to listen to the coaching. So, like I said, y'all let me know what y'all think about the video. I'm going to have another video for y'all a little bit later on this week. Please like, please share, please subscribe to all your Falcons group pages, maybe on a Facebook. Definitely share my video with, with um, you know, any Atlanta Falcons fan you may know, any family member you may know. Um, if you want to donate to the channel, you always can go to Cash App. It'll be my dollar sign, Jew Talk Sports. So the dollar sign or dollar symbol, Jew Talk Sports. But like I said, this has been your boy Jew. Y'all tell me what y'all think in the comments about Dan Quinn, about some of the changes that we've made, how well the defense and the uh, the defense and the offense, so how well the team is playing in general. I just love what this team look like uh, looks like is headed. This team is definitely improving and definitely have improved from the first week of the season or the first eight weeks of the season. To me, they look. Um, we look totally different we look like a whole 360 is taking place we look like a whole different team and i believe that this team is going to make noise we're going to make noise whether we make the playoffs or not we're definitely going to make noise and i'm happy uh to see that our guys are turning the corner but like i said this being your boy jew i'm gonna have some uh other content for y'all a little bit later on uh in the week maybe tomorrow i'll do another video but i'm gonna try to give you guys as many videos as possible um as i can like I said, I look at this as a pleasure to do this. I love talking about my Atlanta Falcons and our Atlanta Falcons. Um, and like I said, I'm going to be doing this whether we win, lose, or draw. I was not one of those fans that went and hid when we were 1-6 and six or 1-7. and seven. I stuck around because I told you the pendulum was going to swing back in our favor, and now it has. So shout out to you guys. 
uh, the ones watching the video, I appreciate you. Got the ones that's gonna share this video, I appreciate you. The goal is to be the biggest Falcons YouTuber um, out. Um, I love all of the other Falcons YouTuber, but I want to give you guys the quality and the truth about every situation that's going on with our Atlanta Falcons. Um, and I like to keep it real. I like to talk about every single thing that's going on out there on the field and things of that nature. But with that being said, this being your boy Jew, I'm going to head out of here, man. Y'all, peace.